G'day, you mob, and welcome to this episode of Aussie English. Today, I have a special interview with guest Malini Sales. Now, Malini is an English teacher, but she is originally from Brazil, and we got in contact probably, I don't know, six months or so ago via Instagram, and uh, when we started chatting, I asked if she'd like to come onto the podcast to talk about her experiences learning English in Brazil, becoming an English teacher in Australia, because it can be done, and I'm sure many of you guys listening to the podcast, obviously, you're trying to improve your English, but you may also be interested in teaching English, you know, or, or maybe you didn't even know that was a possibility, but I've met a few of you guys now who have have ended up full-time English teachers in countries like Australia. So, that is one way that you can end up moving to places like Australia, America and Britain. Anyway, today's interview is a really interesting one. Malini was a pleasure to have on the podcast. Uh, We did kind of just dive straight into it. So, I was going to wait and do a proper intro when I had her there on Skype, but she told a really interesting story about the pronunciation of her name that I thought we'll just get straight into uh, the episode, including that story. So, thank you so much, Malini. And sorry again that I had to ask. I always ask how to pronounce people's names before I get into the podcast because... With my Australian background, I tend to get foreign name pronunciation wrong more often than not. Anyway, let's get into the podcast, guys. And is it it's it's Malini, right? Like if I were to say that with an Australian accent, or do I need to? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> Uh, I, I when I go to cafes and and you know like they ask you your name to give you your coffee because they want to be all yeah, um, yeah customer oriented so oh, what's your name and I say Mileni that's how I pronounce it in Portuguese yeah and they don't understand it and they spell it in a very funny way so uh, or, or they call me something else and then uh, I have a nickname. So, when I go to cafes, I say, my name is Mel. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie, because it's the closest uh, name in English uh, to Mileni, uh, but it's okay. Yeah, I, I got used to uh, Mileen, Mylene, uh, yeah. Melanie eventually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how people do it. We went to have a checkup the other day for Noah and... We had to have his hips looked at. So, I think they have to get checked and just make sure their legs are growing at the same rate. So, we went to the doctor and he comes out and my surname is Smithson, right? So, Mm -hmm. if I were to type that, it's it's S-M-I-S-S-E-N, right? And so, you've got the double S's which show that the I is a short vowel, right? It's not an I sound, it's an I. And so, but every single time someone who doesn't know how to pronounce my name comes out, the doctor comes out, he's like, Noah Smithson? And it's just like... Yeah, I'm like, how do people get this? Because if it was, if it was smitten or something like with two yeah. T's, you would know, right? And yeah. so yeah, yeah, but people always screw that up. So <laughs> I feel you. I feel, and that's native speakers of my language, right? So that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Man, I think we'll leave that part in the podcast. <laughs> so we'll just, <laughs> we've already begun. We've already begun. So um, oh, I was Malini, actually thinking, oh, I, I hope he's going to edit it because you know, like. I may just say something silly. Or... <laughs> no, way, no way, I'm not. I'm not going to go over it that heavily. I think people enjoy people enjoy the authentic, you know, bits and pieces. They don't want it too polished, right? It's oh, kind of yeah. like you, you, you feel <laughs> it's a bit perfectionist. Oh my god, I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, um, that, how know? did you end up? How did you end up in Australia in Sydney teaching English? Tell us your story. Uh, I came here uh, first time in 2009 for a teacher's course for just two months and I thought it was too short and because uh, I, 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 I'd loved the city and I'd loved the experience I had here that time. So uh, yeah, when I went back to Brazil, I continued teaching English and I thought uh, I might go back and stay there for a bit longer, but until I met my husband, I, I, I couldn't do that because I didn't have the courage, I didn't have the money and I don't know, I, I think I needed some support somehow and then I met him and a year later uh, we came here because he gave me all of the support I needed. Uh, He bought the crazy idea that it was to go to a foreign country whose language he didn't even speak 
uh, at that time and 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 yeah and and embark on this adventure so yeah that's yeah that's how i came to australia so the first time was 2009 uh, for a teacher's course and then uh, yeah when we got here in 2015 yeah it was my second time here and his first time here um, I started working as a nanny uh, but I had already done my CELTA course back in Brazil because I, I, I knew that I would m end up teaching English I might have the chance to uh, teach English to foreign students and uh, yeah six months later I got uh, the job uh, as I got a job as an English teacher. Uh, I'm a bit nervous. Sorry, my, my, my yeah. <laughs> relax. Don't worry. Don't worry. No one's listening oh. currently, right? They listen later on, so it's all good. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. How and did it's, you decide, how did you decide that? So you're obviously like, if we go before 2009 and you were in Brazil, obviously, were you um, already? speaking English as well as you you do now and everything like that in Brazil like how did you get to that level I studied by myself you it's, animal it's crazy yeah, yeah yeah man tell us the secrets there then because I get that I mean not to toot my own horn you know you've seen my my Portuguese so it's, it's kind of like good enough to get by but I've never been to Brazil um how did you do that by yourself in Brazil to get your English to such a level? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people listening from back home in their home countries who haven't yet left and are wanting to work on their English. What does it take? What did you do to get your English to such a good level? Uh, it, it it takes a lot of studying, obviously, um, <laughs> a lot of time and dedication, dedication and passion, I would say. Because uh, my dream when I was young uh, was to speak English fluently, but I had no one to talk to, to practice with. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a lot, access to a lot of material. At that time, we didn't have internet. Uh, so it was really, really hard. Uh, I remember going to uh, English schools just to, to ask for information, uh, such as uh, course prices or uh, days of classes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at that time, they had those uh, take one leaflets with lyrics mm -hmm. to the songs which were on the radio at the moment. Um, and I, I, I just go in, ask for information, just to take one of those leaflets, and I'd take them <laughs> home and study. And then, um, yeah, I'd just copy the lyrics, literally copy, copy in a note. Yeah and practice the lyrics over and over again until I could sing the song uh, perfectly. So that's how I started. Far out. So you're one of those who really enjoy using music as a way of learning languages. Uh, yeah, there's a course now in our school called English Through Music that I created. And uh, yeah, because that's how I learned English and that's, uh, that's something I'm also passionate about, music. Why do you think that's so... Like there's a, as a story, I know a girl from Colombia and um, we met because she was interested in English teaching and she'd sent me a, a few emails a few years ago. And when I spoke to her, I was like, you don't have an accent. You've got an American accent. What the, f <laughs> like, what, what the fuck, dude? Like how did you, are you American? And she's like, I've never left Colombia. And I was just like, what? So and cool. um, but she was a musician. She was a singer and she's just been studying since she was like nine years old, watching TV and, you know, practicing the words and everything. And I was like, there must be something to music and especially pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Did you find that that really helped you get your yeah. head around English pronunciation and, ev and everything? Now that you mentioned that, I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I, I, if you're, if you're a, a musical person maybe I, I don't know if you have a knack for music if you if you have a sense of rhythm or something like that it might help you um I don't know it's it's uh, maybe very accurate listening skills or I, I I I don't know what that is to be honest but uh well since I started doing since I was very young I also um I didn't I didn't think much about what people would think about my pronunciation so I yeah. just did I, you know, because nowadays, if my brother, for example, listens to me speaking English, he'll make fun of me because he'll yeah. say I, found, I, I sound funny. And uh, you know, <laughs> you. so you mean he'll make fun of you in Portuguese, though, not in English, or yeah, obviously because he, he can't speak English now. He's yeah. jealous. Um, <laughs> but it's it's funny, isn't it? Because it's like the other side. I remember when I was first learning Portuguese. I kind of there was something inside of me, I think the English side of me that refused to say things like no and tambain oh, yeah. and 
saying those 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 nasal vowels because it felt yeah. embarrassing because if, if i was with other english speakers and you make those sounds of like oh and ing they'd be like whoa what the hell you and so, so i oh, so man you know, i pro i practiced so much to get that right <laughs> but it was funny that it was so embarrassing originally but now it almost got to the point where if I speak Portuguese and don't do it correctly, I, I feel embarrassed, especially around other Portuguese speakers. So it's funny how it comes full circle, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's it. And and I was talking to a student of mine, actually the next student, uh, who came to visit me this week. Uh, he's now living in Melbourne. He studied uh, at Langford's uh, last year, I guess. Um, I remember his uh, pronunciation, his level of English wa was ready advanced mm. and then uh after a year he came back and visited me and we only spoke in english obviously because he went to school uh, and 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 we can't speak any other language but english at school yeah. um, and i was so impressed to see how much he he uh progressed with his pronunciation and he was telling me i, I said mateus it's incredible how much you've progressed in this year or so uh, and your pronunciation is simply outstanding. And he was like, oh, you know, some people, especially Brazilians, uh, some people make fun of me. They think I'm posh. They think I sound uh, snobbish. Uh, and he said, but I don't care. I was like, and that's why we stand out. Sorry, we're being like a bit. <laughs> yeah. But we, we, yeah, just forget about other people's, you know, judgments. And, and, and that's how they sound. So if you want to speak like native speakers, we should imitate them and it works. <laughs> well, that's it. I, I realise with Portuguese that if you don't feel like you're, you know, if it doesn't feel strange, you're probably nowhere near the correct pronunciation, right? Yeah. Like if, 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 you, if you feel like you're saying things, really, you're doing it, you're nailing it, it's all easy, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was the, uh, the trick for people like you and for him with pronunciation? What do people who end up with a really good accent do? do they, is there a certain set of skills that they have or, or things oh, they do? Going back to music. He's the same as me. He also yep. loves music and he studied something to do with music in his uh, vocational course here in Australia. So, again, music, maybe it has to do with, I don't know, the way you process uh, sounds. Yeah. Really. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I've never studied about it, but I would say that there must be some connection there. Yeah. Uh, look, I just imitate people. Yeah. I am. I'm. I'm I'm not shy to just copy what people say and how people say things. Yeah. Is it an ongoing thing too? Because I, I quite often tell my students that you wouldn't go to the gym once and think, yeah, fucking nailed it, you know, fit for the rest of my life. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, you could talk to that. You're a bit of a gym buff, but um, <laughs> it's the same with pronunciation, right? It's an ongoing thing, especially in a foreign language. Like even now, I keep learning things after, I mean, and I'm sure it's probably the same for you, after years of learning Portuguese for me, every now and then, I'll, like um, the pronouns ela and early, I didn't realize that the E at the front of those is different. It's a different vowel sound, right? It no. blew my mind. It blew my mind when I figured that out, and I was like, "What the hell?" And that was years I after. That either. You never knew that. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So things like that, you know, like it's an ongoing process where it's almost like you're you can slowly see better and better and better, but it takes years and years and years, right? So was it the same for English and you? Did you have those? I I think I I, I might um. Uh, I'm afraid to say that I might know uh, more about pronunciation in English than I know about the pronunciation of my own language because uh, um, I just speak Portuguese. I don't I don't yeah. reason things in my mind when I speak my yeah. language. But yeah, you're right. You're, I have well, never noticed that, Ella. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Well, yeah. and English, the funny thing is when I was learning Portuguese, I remember um, muito, right? With the word muito, there's no N in there, but there's, there sounds like there is when you say it. And I remember raging up at one of my um, Brazilian instructors and being like, why the hell is it pronounced this way when there's no, the letters missing in the spelling of the word? And he's just like, English. 
because <laughs> there's so much. I'm like, right, yeah, every second word in English has like some different pronunciation rule. Um, so how did you get around that? How, what was that? Was there a trick to learning, you know, correct pronunciation and spelling? Because there's almost like a a juxtaposition. There's a there's a difference between what you read and what you should say, right? And you have to kind of get over that to improve your pronunciation as a student quite often. Yeah. Well, is there a trick to it or is it just time time in the gym? Studying. Yeah, no, I had to study that. I had to study. As a teacher, I uh, there is a, a, a course, uh, um, a, a class actually. We call it a course, but uh, students don't do it for 10 weeks. They, they might if they want, but they don't do it for 10 weeks. There, there's a class at Langford's called Pronunciation and Conversation. Um, and we do teach pronunciation, like pure pronunciation. And uh, yeah, because I taught that class uh, for a long time, I had to study a lot because uh, I must confess, I didn't know about uh, rules. I didn't I didn't know yeah. the rules for pronunciation. I didn't even know, I was not even aware that there were rules for oh, pronunciation. Man. I didn't know any of them. Before I was doing Aussie English and making some of the content that I do, I had no idea with a lot of this stuff. I had to look it up. I have to buy like a whole bunch of books and, and jump in there because like, I could do it without thinking about it, like with you in Portuguese. But yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And then I had to study before teaching. So yeah, that that's that's that was one of the things that helped, uh, helped me polish up my pronunciation. Uh, but also, as I said, uh, copying, being very attentive to the way native speakers speak. Yeah. They pronounce different words. Or like here in Australia, I used to be a nanny to a British family. And I noticed how, how they pronounce the words and I would copy them. But oftentimes I would realize that, oh, the way they pronounce this word is different to the way I used to pronounce that that word. So oh, I'd get confused. And then uh, when I when I heard Australians pronouncing the same word, it was like, oh my god! Mm-hmm. Um, um, I have to I have to choose one. Uh, it, it, it yeah, it, it bugs your brain. Uh, I was I was wondering that because as soon as you started talking, I'm like, she has a British a British accent. It's not Australian. <laughs> I I I'm, I'm, I I don't have an identity in English, and and no, there's nothing so, wrong with that. It's awesome. Oh uh, no no, it's 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 horrible. I I. I feel like I need to have an identity. <laughs> I'm like, uh, seriously, yeah, because I know who I am. I mean, I, I, I know myself in Portuguese. Uh, and, and I know, for example, I wouldn't pronounce the word heart in Portuguese, coração, mm. with, with, a, with an accent from the northeast. It's, where, where is Kel from? Uh, Maranhão. Maranhão. So she, yeah. she, I guess she would say coração. I yeah, know, I think- she said coração, yeah. Yeah, I would never pronounce it this way. I would say coração. I'm, yeah. I'm from São Paulo. I'm Paulista. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. And, and these things, um, uh, your pronunciation uh, shows people where you're from. It's your identity. I studied bilingualism at post graduation, and 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 oh my god, it's so deep. And I feel, I feel. I don't know how to explain how I feel. I just, I just feel lost. And oftentimes people will, they'll ask me, um, are you British? Are you Aussie? And I'm like, no, I'm Brazilian. And they will, <laughs> yes, I, after, after a whole week of classes, our student found out that it was Brazilian. And he, mm. he was like, how come? <laughs> I didn't pick that up. It was like, I, I, I feel I don't have an identity. But it's, t- like, it's tough, isn't it? Because it's almost like first world problems where if you had a really thick, if you had a th- really thick Brazilian accent, you'd be like, God damn it, I just want to get rid of this accent and, and not have this accent. Yeah, exactly. But now that you don't have it, you're like, God damn it, I just wanted a, you know, an Australian um, personality. <laughs> so what about slang, though? Like, do you think a big part of it might not necessarily be accent, but that you have you picked up certain ways, certain things that Australians say that you can sort of accentuate? Because one of those things, again, we, I keep rabbiting on about Portuguese, but that's my sort of example. Um, Kel is always saying stuff to me at home that is very northeast Brazil. So I'll I'll say things like oh eita or eguas or eha jash <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and all of our, so these are all like little um exclamations right. So if she gets surprised, she'll be like oh eguas, but it's not said by the rest of Brazil. 
And so I feel like now she'll be like, I'm making you into a, a Maranhense. I'm turning you into a Northeaster, a Northeasterner. Because if you go to Brazil, you'll be saying all these little things and everyone's going to be like, what? <laughs> you go to Sao Paulo and you say Eguas. <laughs> <laughs> She's got... She bought, up, like me now. She, she bought a T-shirt for um, Noah that just has Eguas on the front of it. My uh, my son, baby. So. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, I, I've never heard that before. <laughs> really, really far out. Yes, yeah, she's got heaps of them. But um, did you pick up things like that in Australia? Did you? Are there loads of things that you started saying that helped you fit in, especially with the amount of slang that we have? I do. I do say things like servo, garbo, uh, sicky, um, <laughs> prezi, crazy, <laughs> uh, fair dinkum. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else do I say? Good day. Um, I, I do use some, but not a lot of them. Like just these sh- uh, uh, chucky, bicky, just these short words. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. But in terms of idioms, not many, to be honest. Um, what yeah. do you say to students who come to you and say, because I've had a few from Colombia is a good example, where um, they were, I think they have very sort of a stratified society where there's different classes right there's the guys at the top and the guys at the bottom and I I think I met some people who um, were like I don't want to use slang because that's something that you know people from the lower class will do and I don't want to appear like that should I learn slang in Australia and I'm like well we're kind of homogenized it's just sort of one one class so you'll hear the prime minister using slang you'll hear you know Garbo's using slang everyone uses slang everyone tries to just speak the same way so what what sort of advice do you have for students who say you know should I learn um, slang and colloquialisms in in Australian English? Uh, if you want to fit in, yes, yeah. <laughs> you should. Yeah, yeah, because that's how I feel. Um, yeah, I feel that I, I I belong to the group because I do the same as they do. Uh, yeah, so yeah, totally. And we do have uh, Aussie English classes there at school too. So uh, it, it's school, and and we try to incorporate it into their the, the the speaking activities we do in class. And I do I do encourage them at least like these little things, uh, or at least um, we try to raise their awareness um, to the fact that look, this exists. If you want to understand English or Aussie English better. You should you should you should learn the 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 slangs that they use. You should try to practice. Uh, you should try and watch more TV and listen to pod, uh, Aussie English podcasts and uh, listen to the radio. Listen yeah. to the radio, and you see people using that. And and then maybe if they have this kind of prejudice, uh, yeah, they they would see that there's nothing wrong with using slang, and and does it, it doesn't make them uh, sound poor, rich, or educated, non-educated. Here in Australia, it's not the same. Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. And I'm always saying to them, just use this, not necessarily like every other word, you know, using slang, but use those common ones like Arvo, Barbie, G'day, how's it going, you know, because it makes me feel at ease. If you were to greet me in the street and be like, hey, Pete, you know, how's it going, mate? I'd be like, oh, yeah, he knows what's up. Instead of, you know, if, if you just said, how do you do, that would instantly make me feel uncomfortable because I'd be like, oh, this is formal. <laughs> So, did you experience much culture shock when you came to Australia? Were there big things that were different here from Brazil? Um, the cleaning, the, the, the house cleaning is a big issue to me. Uh, the cleaning of environments in general. Um, yes, because we are uh, kind of OCD in Brazil. <laughs> I don't know if Kel is like that. Yeah. But everywhere I go, I have. Uh, like a three at least three different types of wipes in my bag really? uh, yes yes I wipe everything everywhere uh, hands surfaces even at school uh, yeah. when I teach first thing I do is to clean the desktop and the computer I'm going to use so uh, the standard uh, yeah the standard of cleanliness is is, is, is at a different level. That, <laughs> that annoyed me. Yes, yes. Why do you Why do you think that is? Why Why are uh, Brazil so anal about cleanliness? <sighs> why I don't know why, but I can see you. Are, you are a lot more laid back than yeah. us. Like when it comes to cleaning, uh, because you have uh, 
you have the beach. So I just go down the road and I'm at the beach. So why would I spend the whole Saturday cleaning my house if I can go and enjoy the day? So I kind of understand you now. Um, but yeah, for example, in Sao Paulo, I think we don't have better things to do. So we clean the house. <laughs> <keep ourselves busy. laughs> just I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, you take Milani out of Brazil, but you don't take Brazil out of Milani. So my Brazilianness, um, yeah, shines when it comes to things like that. So uh, yeah, yeah. I so that was the first thing. Everywhere I when I first got here, uh, uh, something that really shocked me was how dusty all the surfaces everywhere were. Oh, I was like, oh my god, no, no one dusts. The place is here. No one, you know, wipes <laughs> the surfaces. How come? Doesn't it annoy them? And ah, uh, yeah, that 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 annoys me. Yeah, uh, a lot. That and is- now I'm going to spend the rest of the day analyzing my house and being like, oh my god, what would Melanie <laughs> think? Like, there's going to be crap everywhere that I need to clean. <laughs> <laughs> Far out. Um. um- so that was the first thing, and um, because I think, um, yeah, I'm a Virgo too. I don't know if you believe in star signs. So that's that's something that uh, that's uh, one of the um, most prominent features of my personality. Yeah, mm-hmm. being Virgo, uh, I'm, I'm extremely like uh, exaggeratedly organized and uh, clean. Yeah, so maybe that's <laughs> that's. Yeah, because of my personality too. Um, and what else? Uh, oh, your eating habits? Mine. Uh, your <laughs> Australia. Oh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was the culture shock. You came to Australia and saw me eating on Instagram or something, and you were like, Jesus. <laughs> it's Vegemite for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> no Australian eating habits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, How do they differ from Brazil? Because you guys are messed up. You have cheese in sushi. I mean, what's up with that? Cheese and sushi. You mean cream yeah. cheese? Yeah, and tomato sauce on pizza. What's up with that? No, don't. Not in Sao Paulo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our Italian background in Sao Paulo is quite strong. So we, well, at least the people I know, we don't put yeah. tomato on pizza we know kel, kel does but, that incessantly that's the only time she has tomato sauce i'm always like what is wrong with you <laughs> it already has tomato sauce on it. <laughs> it, it it's actually tomato paste not tomato sauce but oh, yeah. uh, i mean but it, i i heard that in rio and in in other parts of brazil people do that but in sao paulo uh, i don't think we do that yeah i mean not n- n- not the people i know i can i can yeah yeah, I can't, I can't, I'm speaking for myself and the people I know, but yeah, it's not very common. Um, one, I mean, one I heard the other day that, that um, blew my mind because I'm yet to go to Brazil is the sewerage system here in Australia is apparently really good. And that oh, in Brazil, you guys oh. don't put the toilet paper in the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? And it's, I mean, you can probably tell us why exactly, but is it the systems that get blocked up more easily in Brazil than they do yeah. here in Australia or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, is I, that, think... I feel like I'm going to go to Kel's house and just ruin their houses without thinking about it because I'll block the pipes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in this regard, I think we are far behind. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's disgusting. And and when I went to Brazil like two years ago, when I went back to Brazil to visit my family, I kept throwing toilet paper in the toilet. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Uh, I, I, I kept forgetting that it was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not what I was supposed to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. and then I, I felt disgusting. I felt like, oh my god, I have to do that. No, it's it's horrible. <laughs> it's and what about first cultural shock? Yeah, yeah. When you go back, were there other things like that too? Did you did you go back home and you were like, oh my god, I had no idea. You see Brazil through the lens of Australia. Yes, um, um, uh, having to uh, dress up to go to the mall is something uh, like it, it's a must in Brazil. You go to the mall, at least in Sao Paulo. Yeah, um, yeah because I, I always say in Sao Paulo, because Brazil is huge and we are all yeah. different everywhere you go. Uh, yeah, but in my neighbourhood, uh, everybody would dress up to go to the mall. And here you see people 
like you, you see you see people going straight from the beach to the mall uh, in their swimsuit or barefoot or uh, with their hair wet and and oh seriously uh, I, I I like uh, the Aussie laid backness I don't know if I can say that <laughs> I for love, sure I Kel love Kel it. saw someone the other day at um at the supermarket without shoes on and I was like she was like what the hell is he ho- is he homeless and I'm like Kelly he's like it's like a 12 year old kid like it's, it's he just doesn't care you know he's it's hot he doesn't have thongs I don't know he's just decided he didn't want to wear thongs I, I'm I do that sometimes and she's like what never never you know and I'm like we find just- it disgusting because we think that the street is dirty so yeah. oh it is but yeah. you know <laughs> no one's got time for shoes I, I don't know. I don't know how you don't get your uh, the soles of your feet burnt because it's so hot. Oh, yeah. On the road. Well, you don't walk across the bitumen, you know. You don't oh, sit there for hours. <laughs> I see people. I go to Mali and I see heaps of people walking barefoot in the street. I'm like, oh, my God, how, how are your feet not burning? <laughs> it's brutal. Yeah. Um, switching gears on to students in Australia taking classes. So you're teaching at Langports. Tell us a bit about that first. How do you find that? Uh, teaching or Langports? Well, wow, both. <laughs> you know, tell tell us the story. How did you end up at Langports, and, and what's it like, like teaching a foreign language? Uh, yeah, Langports is my second house. Yeah. Uh, so as I told you, after six months, I got here. I got this job at Langports, and I've been there ever since. Yeah. Uh, and I've taught all of the levels. I've done a little bit of everything, I guess. Yeah, by now. Uh, so I've done some teaching and there was a time where I had to renew my visa. I had to go to Thailand and I had to stay away for two months. And when I got back, they didn't have, um, a teaching position for me anymore. And I had to do reception. And then, uh, well lately, because I've taught all of the levels, I was like, ah, uh, what else to do? I've taught all of the levels. Nothing is new to me anymore. There's no novelty here for me anymore. And then I started, um, uh, training, uh, with the director of study, so I was uh, doing some uh, assistant director of study duties, and uh, yeah, I also um, clean all of the places um, <laughs> to um, yeah everything. So I, lit- I literally do a little bit of everything there, um, and yeah, it's my second house. I just love that school. I love my uh, co-workers. Everyone's very supportive. It's like a family there. Uh, and the students, they are absolutely amazing. I remember um, getting a bit tired uh, of teaching adults in Brazil because they would always complain, oh, it's difficult. They would always make a thousand excuses uh, to justify why they didn't do homework, why they didn't practice um, pronunciation at home, why they didn't uh, do X, Y, Z. And that that just made me it, I, I had such a negative vibe from uh, those students and then uh, I, I just got tired of that and went on to teaching kids uh, which is complete mm-hmm. they were woo-hoo, they had a smile upon your face today and I love kids I love kids um and uh, yeah, I graduated in education, so I'm um, originally a preschool, elementary school teacher. So I started doing that in English, and then yeah, that that was great. So I I've, I've com- I completely changed the environment I was in, and then uh, yeah, so I remember uh, back in the day not wanting to teach adults anymore. Yeah, and then when I came here. Um, yeah, I got this job and I teach adults. And I was like, oh, again, uh, I, I, I was afraid of what I was going to encounter. But students who come here, they really want to study. Mm-hmm. They come here with a different mindset and they come here for just a short period of time. So some of them will complain because they have to work after school and they will go to bed late and they will off they'll often come to you on the next day and say, oh, teacher, sorry, I left my job. At, I, I left work at, um, let's say, midnight because they work at restaurants. Um, they do all sorts of jobs and uh, they do events, functions. Uh, I left I left work after, after uh, I'm stammering, sorry. I left work after midnight and I couldn't do my homework, blah, blah, blah. But it, it will be, you know, on rare occasions. Uh, but they have a very positive uh, um, 
attitude here. Yeah. So it, it kind it kind it kind of uh, feeds me back. So uh, I'm 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 generally always very motivated to che- to teach them because I have this uh, energy, this positive attitude. I get this positive vibe from vibe from them, and um, yeah, it's it's just. Um, I don't know, it, it, and it's always new. I always feel because I here, um, differently from Brazil, you have different students every week. Yeah. And then Langport has this different system called UFO, uh, uh, use, focus, and options, where the teacher teaches uh, two hours of general English in the morning. So you have uh, your group, uh, intermediate, uh, elementary, advanced, upper intermediate. And then um, you have the focus class in the middle of the day uh, for one hour. And the focus classes, the skills classes, uh, writing, reading, listening and speaking, each skill on a different day. Uh, And then for that hour, you have a different group of students. So you teach a group of students for two hours in the morning and then another group of students for another hour. Yeah. I think that would make sense, right? Because you would probably get, if the student has the same teacher for the entire day and they're studying, you know, the same thing for the entire day, you can imagine they're, they're going to just shut off pretty quickly, right? But if you keep sort of adding novelty by changing the subject, t- changing the environment, the teacher, then they're going to stay more engaged, I imagine. Uh, yeah, that, that, I think that's the rationale behind it. Uh, and also their idea is that... Uh, students are not in the same level for all yeah. of the skills. So they separate, they, they separate the students into their level of listening, reading, writing, speaking. So uh, two students might be together in their general English class, but they might go to different classes for their listening class because they are in different levels. Yeah. Listen- yeah. Um, so that is another reason why uh, they have these different classes and then after lunch they have uh, a class called options uh, which means students can choose the class they want to attend Um, they can choose uh, pronunciation if they think they need to pronunciation and conversation if they need to they they need to um, develop their pronunciation skills or their speaking skills if they uh, feel that they need more grammar they can do grammar, uh, elementary, uh, intermediate or advanced. Uh, they also have business, IELTS, Cambridge skills, uh, what else? Vocabulary, uh, elementary, intermediate and advanced. So, students so, can- so how, does it, how does it work exactly? Do they enroll in the school and then they select different classes for their own sort of curriculum or are they given one? So on the first day, uh, which is usually Monday, they are tested. And based on their results, uh, the director and the assistant director of studies both sit together and they uh, place the students in the level um, they should be according to their score, yep. basically. Yeah. So initially, um, it's the director of studies and the assistant both um, who put the students in a certain option class, but later on they can change. Oh, brilliant. And so what are the, what does a successful student look like? If you could describe, you know, the students who, who come to Langports or, or any other English school and they get the most out of it, do they have a certain, um, you know, set of skills or behaviours or habits that, that you see time and time again that lead to, you know, success? Um, number one, uh, if you come to a foreign country to learn a foreign language, you should practice the foreign language you come to study, yeah? <laughs> that you came here to study. Yeah. Uh, uh, what happens is um, a lot of students uh, tend to mingle with people from the same country, mm-hmm. the same country they were from, and this is very negative. So the first thing would be mingle with students from other countries. Because so, that's something I get told quite often. They'll be like, but how do I meet other Australians? 
um, you know, when I've just arrived and I'll say, you don't have to meet other Australians. You just have to meet anyone who doesn't speak your native language as their native language, right? Mm-hmm. Where the common language is English. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the first thing. So try to speak to, uh, yeah, people who don't speak the same language as you and then you'll be forced to speak English. Yeah. That's a good habit that uh, a great student would um, have. Uh, what else? Um, homework. I know it's so cliche. Yeah, people, students may hate when teachers say that. But like from experience, I can say I, I, I learned English almost all by myself. Later on, I went to school and I studied English uh, in a language school. But most of what I know, I learned by myself. Yeah. So and how did I do that? Literally sitting at my desk and studying. Giving studying. yourself homework every single day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, grammar, pronunciation, reading, reading. I remember we didn't. I, I didn't have internet growing up. So um, when I found a, a magazine in English, when someone gave me, uh, even if it was a known magazine in English, I would devour that. I was like, oh my god, this is so precious, yeah. regardless of the subject. Just because mm-hmm. that was English. I was like, oh, my God, there, there must be a thousand words I don't know here. And I'm, I want to learn all of them. So this eagerness is also important. Yeah, you have to be eager. You have to be, you have to have that insatiable desire to learn more and more. Because the process is never complete. It's, as you said, it's an ongoing thing. It's do, you think, uh, do you think many students come in with sort of uh, the wrong expectations too? Where they'll think, I'll come to class and the teacher will teach and I will just absorb, but they don't realize that it's sort of the inverse where the teacher's there to sort of inspire and just give them access to information, but they have to be the ones sort of driving, right? They have to be the ones that are teaching themselves. You described it so perfectly that, yes, that's exactly, yeah, (laughs) that's exactly what happens. And oftentimes they think that, oh, I'm going to a foreign country, I'm going to an English-speaking country, uh, which means I'll be surrounded by English, which means I'll absorb everything mm-hmm. and in six months I'll be speaking fluently. Yeah. And that is so not true. Um, yeah, I, I, I've I lost count of how many times I've had student come, students come to me and say, and, and crying, say to, saying to me, oh, I've been here for six months and I haven't learned anything. I was like, oh, it's not that simple, especially if they come yeah. here with no English. Uh, it, it, it's, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. So first you have to get used to the sound of English. You have to get used to the accent. You have to learn a lot of words. You need a lot of vocabulary to be able to understand English reasonably well. And then uh, when it comes to speaking, you need to uh, understand the structure of sentences to be able to f- make sentences and, and convey your message. Um, it is a long process. And then you have... You, for you to develop fluency, you have to be able to do all of that quicker and quicker, which requires your brain to be um, very familiarized with with yeah. this this process of receiving and giving back information. Um, it takes it takes time, as anything in life. Practice, practice is is the key. Repetition. Um, so it. it happens quite often yeah so they come here thinking that they're going to learn english or that that just being in the classroom listening to the teacher um is is going to make them speak is going to make them uh become better uh, writers better speakers and 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 that's not true in my class i'm teaching an advanced level now i tell them in cae uh there is very little teaching because you're supposed to know all of the grammar by now yeah you're just to revise the structures and we're going to practice them. We're going to try to uh, use the structures that we'll revise in writing, in speaking, um, and uh, that's pretty much it. And then we're going to repeat and repeat and repeat all of that over and over again. We're going to write like four or five essays. We're going to write four, at least two or three reports, uh, letters, Using all of the same, uh, all of those structures that you revised that you yeah. you were meant to come here already knowing or at least uh, being aware 
of their existence. So, um, but yes, but yeah, yeah, that's it. And um, it, it, it's hard for them to understand that, but yeah, it, they learn they learn the hard way. It's yeah. It's it's funny though because I think it is like weight loss, right, or going to the gym where it's like go hard to begin with, and it only gets easier, right? You can get if you you come to Australia and you start learning English, really set up those things like you know living with people who don't speak your native language, um, working hard, getting in good habits, getting into a routine, and just putting the time in for the first six months, and it'll pay dividends you know, later on and you won't have to work as hard or it won't feel like you're working as hard to keep improving, right? But quite often people, they get here and they don't want to go too far outside of their comfort zone, right? And so they end up actually having a much harder time overall for a longer period of time than if they just really nailed nailed down, worked hard in the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as you said, it's like going to the gym. Yes, you, you can't stop. If you stop going to the gym, your muscles will shrink, um, yeah, if you stop practicing, if you stop reading in English, you're going to get rusty. If you stop uh, speaking in English, your 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 fluency levels will decrease. So, um, yeah, it, it's um, it's the process will never be complete. Yeah, but that that's what I can say. If you want to um, get to a proficiency level, that's you have to develop habits. It's like if you want to have a, a of nice body shape, uh, you have to develop healthy eating habits. Um, so if you want to uh, speak like a native speaker or uh, if you want to increase your fluency levels, improve your pronunciation skills, etc., etc., you have to develop habits. So uh, try to read a, an article on the internet every day. Try to read the news every day. Just do a little bit every day. And it's those little things that count, right? Like I, you change your phone into English, change Facebook into English, you know, watch the news in English, read your articles, you know, like all of those pages that you would otherwise like in Portuguese or your native language in English, the equivalent, so that you just, it's little bit by little bit, your whole world sort of gets uh, anglicized, I guess, yeah. Exactly. A silly thing I did yesterday, um, I had some black heads on my face and, and I was like, oh, why do I have so many? I was like, where do they come from? What? And, you know, I sort of uh, <laughs> asked myself these questions and I was like, okay, I'm going to YouTube or read something about it. And then instead of reading about it in Portuguese, I looked mm. it up in English. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's it's just a habit. It's just a habit. Well, like, this is YouTube. one of those things I envy you guys learning English so much because – in pretty much any language, any other language in the world that you speak as a native language, when you start learning English, things open up in in terms of how much information, media, movies, podcasts, books, you name it, how much access you have to just so many different things. The internet is effectively in English, right? But for me, when I was learning Portuguese, it was like a bottleneck where all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, holy crap, there's, you know, telenovelas and that's about it, right? Like, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But <laughs> but it, there's much there's much fewer podcasts, there's fewer books, and especially in Australia, it's so much harder to get access to any of that stuff. So you m- almost don't have an excuse, right? If you're, if you're interested in anything and you're learning English, you can learn about that thing in English or you can look it up in English if you're trying to research it. Uh, yeah, because I guess, uh, yeah, the amount of um, people who speak English, uh, yeah, it's like, I, I, I don't know the, the right number, the right figure, but it's, yeah, there are a lot more people who speak English in the world uh, than people who speak Portuguese. And yeah. uh, I, it's like uh, people who study, uh, I don't know, people who do research, also most of them publish their the, the results of their research yeah. in English. So yeah, you have more access to yeah, literally everything you want in English rather than in Portuguese. Um, yeah, that's a shame. But that, that's a key though, right, isn't it? It's working out what you're interested in and it could be anything and then just following that interest but doing it in the context of English. So if you like video games, play them in English. If you like, you know, crime novels, read them in English. You can you can choose your own adventure, but that's the key to staying motivated and can use English as sort of like it's a byproduct. Improving your English is a byproduct of following your passion that you already have, whether it's, you know, learning how to better clean toilets, whatever. 
<laughs> you know, just keep doing that, but do it in English. Like I, I recently got a PlayStation Four. I was like, ah, screw it, I'll get one. We need a, we need a DVD player in the house. <laughs> so I got that, but I bought. Sorry. Good excuse. I know exactly, but I bought a bunch of games that are in Portuguese that have Portuguese, and so I was like, look, Kel, I'm learning. <laughs> But it was in it was in Portuguese from Portugal, so that actually screwed me up quite a lot. I think that was saying things like cum caraças oh, and um Heus <laughs> Chipato. So all of these expressions that are very weird that I've never heard. But um Melanie, <laughs> finishing up, um, how do you meet Australians? I get that question all the time and I'm like, uh-huh. go outside. But what is your advice if you come to Australia for, from a foreign country and you really want to integrate and, and you know, build a friendship network of Australians, do you have any advice for what you can do as a foreigner? Ah, you got me because, honestly, I don't have many Australian friends. <laughs> <laughs> you got one. You got one here. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, look, I'm very lucky because I work in an English school. So, yes, there are Australians there, obviously. And um, I'm friends with them and, and especially um, one of them or two. Or, yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite close. Like, I'm, 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 I'm friends. I'm really, really friends with them. Um yeah, was, the there trick, was there a trick to that though? Because I get asked, it's almost like there's some sort of riddle or some sort of secret to finding other Australians. But um, you know, ultimately you have to go where they are, right? And just be interested in what they're interested in, and just pursue those sorts of places as opposed to staying, you know, where there are lots of non-natives. I would imagine. Uh, oh, the thing uh, I find it so tricky because uh, look, um, I, I thought I, I thought about that a few times <clears throat> and I also found it quite difficult to make Australian friends except you know for the ones I have from school yeah. uh, the, uh, I have this friend Danielle she sits right next to me she's a, she's a little bit younger than me but we have a lot of things in common <clears throat> uh, so um, yeah so that was one of the things which brought us together but apart from that I, for example, I go to the gym here. I go. I, I, we've been going to the same gym. <clears throat> excuse me, my husband and I for let's say two or three years. Yeah. Uh, people don't talk to you here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like you look at the same faces, you see the same faces every single day, and they don't say hi to you. It's hard though. That I mean, I I was thinking about that recently. When I was, um, you know, a bit of a gym junkie and a big problem, I think, is guys look at other guys and they're like, yeah, yeah, this guy's a douchebag. You know, they have that kind of like, ah, yeah. Blah, blah. And then you open your mouth and talk to them. And you're like, oh, actually, he's a really nice guy. Like, but, <laughs> but and with women, I think, especially as a man going to the gym, it's just leave them alone. Don't look at them. Don't oh, talk to them, that. you know, yeah. because you don't want to creep them out or, or you, you don't want them to think that you're you know, perving on them. Yeah, exactly. So it's always like, oh my God, you know, just leave them alone. They, they're just doing their thing. And then they, they want to feel comfortable, like don't talk to them, but yeah. And then sometimes you'll talk to them, get to know them and they'll be like really lovely people. And you're like, Fuck, yeah. we should have done this way earlier. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So apart from going to work every day, I go to yeah. the gym in the evenings, yeah. I teach at the gym and then I also, I do my workout at the gym and uh, except for my Zumba people, like, you know, I'm, I'm a Zumba instructor in the evening. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, there I meet Australians too. But except f- because I'm very lucky to be there because I am the instructor, I'd say, oh, sorry, I, I, I don't think that's the answer you would like me to. No, 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 be- no, go for it though. Go for it. It's, it's still. I find it difficult to, to make Australian yeah. friends. Um. I it's interesting because I keep thinking about when I go to Brazil for the first time and I have a feeling that it's not going to be difficult for me to meet Brazilians when I go not. to Brazil. Because I mean, it's all- not necessarily the same. Yeah, I think they're going to jump on me and be like, oh, my God, there's a guy who's interested in Brazil <laughs> and Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, an alien. Someone yeah. Did- Can I get a photo? <laughs> yeah, everyone is already different. 
So I don't know. I don't know. I find it, I, I I myself find it quite hard to make Australian friends too. But that sounds that sounds like you're very busy and you have sort of a, a regime yeah. set up where you're probably not mi- mingling with many new Australians oh, that often. Yeah. Well, so. day and night, that's another thing. Yes, I have two jobs, and uh, yeah, that that's basically all all I do. Yeah, finish school in the morning in the afternoon and go to the gym in the evening and then my day finishes at nine and I get home you know that and that's it see my husband cook have a shower and go to bed um yes I don't have a lot of time to mingle and see people out there but I I just think I'm lucky to have Australians around uh everywhere I go um but mm, if it if it weren't for that honestly I don't know, I would try to go to the RSL club, I'll try to go to, <laughs> I don't know, go out. Um, yeah, and, and I don't know, you have to put yourself out there. That's the thing. Um, seek and you will find. That's the secret. <laughs> and well, and it's funny because we moved back to Ocean Grove after I was in Melbourne at uni for 10 years and then we went to Canberra because Kel was working for the embassy there and then we came back here. And I haven't made any new friends in Ocean Grove and I've been here for more than a year now, you know, and I, I mean, I, you go out and you see, you know, the same familiar faces at cafes or whatever, but it's, it's so hard, especially at this age, I feel of really developing new friendships that are strong and that you can like, I can't, it's so difficult to just meet someone in the street or at an event and then come over to my house, meet my family. Like, let's chill out all the time. It's really difficult, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. In Brazil, like, if someone is passing by, you, you meet them and, um, I mean, if, if you're friends with them and you, you see them just passing by in front of your house, you, you're you going to invite them to your house and, yeah, you're going to have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, you know, got a story for you. I've got a story for you. When I was getting into photography and wildlife photography, I would go to this lake nearby in Ocean Grove quite a bit and you could walk around it, take photos of birds and whatever else was there. And I kept seeing this guy who was doing the same thing and I would chat to him and he was like, oh, I've been, I was in Maranhão. I used to, you know, work for one of the mining companies or something there. And I was like, oh, my wife's from Maranhão, like crazy. Yeah. And so we were chatting and and I I told Kel and he's like, when are we going to his for dinner? And I was like, what? what? And she's like, he didn't ask us over? That's so rude. You've seen him like four times. You know, you're <laughs> chatting for like half an hour each time and he doesn't ask us to his house. And I was like, dude. <laughs> and she's like, if we were in Brazil, that would totally be happening. <laughs> Why doesn't he like us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so true. That's so true. But, yeah, but here I feel like you, you have to plan. You have to, you know, uh, have that on your calendar. <laughs> it's a bit and, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, but yeah, you 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 have you have to put yourself out there and and um yeah and, and try. Yeah. yeah, just 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 try. People people tend um, here in Australia. I I find people very uh, welcoming and open minded. So um, give it a try. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Malini, thanks so much. I've had you for about an hour now. Um, where can oh. people find out? It Where can people like find out more about you? Sorry? It didn't even feel like an hour. I know. Well, they're the best podcasts, I think, when you just get to <laughs> rab it away. Um, where can people follow you or find out more about you or about your school? <clears throat> okay, my school, at Langports on Instagram or langports.com. It's their website. Uh, we're in Sydney, but they also have mm, a campus uh, on the Gold Coast and another one in Brisbane. Um my, I, I've got two different Instagram accounts <laughs> because I do two <laughs> different things. And, um, yeah, one is at Milani.teacher and the other one is at Milani.fit. Um, yeah, so, yeah, you can find me there and, yeah. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. I'll leave all the links in the uh, in the transcript and everything. But thank you so much for today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Um, Almost like in person now. (laughs) I know. It feels like that, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Thank you, Pete. All right. Once again, thank you so much, Malini Sales, for coming on the podcast. Remember, guys, if you want to check out Malini, you can find her on Instagram. I'll make sure that I include her Instagram links in the transcript and on the website. 
so that you can check her out and also check out the school that she teaches for called Langports and I believe they have schools in Brisbane, the Gold Coast and Sydney. By the sounds of it, these schools are absolutely amazing places to level up your English. Anyway, thanks so much again for joining me, guys. It's always a pleasure and I'll chat to you next time. Peace. Peace.